can do nothing without you, but all things are possible with you, Lord. When you come into the Pentecostal church, you'll find a music that's fast and exuberating. You'll see people shouting. They'll run across the aisles. They'll jump up and down. They express their faith in untraditional ways. People who don't understand that would come in and say, man, these people's nuts. But the Pentecostal movement is fast becoming a religious force to be reckoned with. We are all guilty before Jesus Christ. From their crusades that draw enormous crowds to their mystifying speaking in tongues. My mouth was just taken over by the presence of God. And I began to speak in a language that I never learned in school. It's when the emotional expression comes directly out without having to be formulated in, in words. We'll go inside this movement as MSNBC investigates Pentecostals moving millions. It's been a long time coming, but hold on, world, we have arrived. To walk into a Pentecostal church is to walk into a place unlike most other places of worship. It's loud, energetic, much of it is unscripted, and the services are punctuated with worshipers speaking in tongues, making what might seem to outsiders to be strange sounds that believers say prove the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecostalism is a religious movement filled with charisma that has drawn in more than 500 million followers worldwide. Somebody help me. I don't care. As the Pentecostal church turned 100, there was reason for pride and celebration. After a century of rejection from mainstream churches, Pentecostals are now legitimate, prosperous, and powerful. Their visceral, high-energy religious movement spans from the heartlands to the inner cities. One of every four Christians is now a member of a Pentecostal church. Against the works of darkness, we declare they shall collapse before the authority of the cross. Pastor Jack Hayford, founding pastor of the Church on the Way in Van Nuys, California, has spread the message of the Pentecost to his congregation for over 30 years. The day the church was born, the evangelistic significance of speaking in tongues was established because the Lord poured out the Holy Spirit for the purpose of touching the world with the love of God. Speaking in tongues. It's a mysterious kind of prayer most churchgoers have never seen. Speaking with tongues was a way of the Lord saying, there is a miracle with an immediate presence of you even now, and so you can expect miracle grace to travel with you. Although the worshipers wouldn't allow us to hear up close exactly what they are saying, speaking in tongues is the secret human element that's put the Pentecostal movement at the forefront of the revival of religion across America. They talk about having been touched by the Holy Spirit, having met God. Harvard Divinity professor Harvey Cox explains the draw of the Pentecostal movement to those who seek a direct experience with God. I think that we're in a period now in which across the board, in various religious traditions, there are more and more people who are trying to get back to the, to the experiential level. Speaking with tongues, I believe, is a part of igniting a boldness to expect the Lord to put that miracle touch through you. But more liberal church leaders like Father Ed Bacon, rector of the All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena, California, questions the Pentecostals' politics and their prayer. Our congregation does not embrace speaking in tongues or other form of ecstatic worship. That is not a part of our tradition. It's not a part of our culture. Pentecostals believe that God can enter their body and communicate through them, revealing himself directly when they speak in tongues. The emotional expression comes directly out without having to be formulated in, in words. Professor Cox equates speaking in tongues to what he calls primal speech. What may be happening, in part, in uh, speaking in tongues, is people are reclaiming this kind of connection 
to what I call primal speech. Pentecostals have a name for their mysterious words. They call it glossolalia, language of the divine. David Bernard is dean of the future Urshan Graduate School of Theology for Pentecostal ministers. He explains that speaking in glossolalia, or tongues, marks what Pentecostals call a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is the initial sign of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is essential to the born-again experience. A term embraced by fundamentalist Christianity, being born again marks a renewal of a believer's relationship with God. It also often marks the embracing of conservative dress, conservative politics, and an abstinence from drinking and smoking. God's healing people all over this place. An inguinal hernia has been healed. Uh, several people being healed of hemorrhoids and, and varicose veins. The Lord is Christian healing. Coalition founder Pat Robertson has capitalized on the conservative political views of many Pentecostals. Although he considers himself an evangelical Christian as opposed to a Pentecostal, Robertson describes how Pentecostals find their code for 21st century living in the pages of the Bible. They are concerned about trends in our society that has to do with uh, uh, widespread abortion, that, you know, pornography, uh, uh, the absence of prayer and Bible reading in the schools, the indoctrination of children into lifestyles that they think is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Frequently, a Pentecostal experience, as I am aware of it in the Episcopal Church, is associated with a conservative theological and conservative political position, which I find to be incompatible with the gospel. But Pentecostals claim all they do is interpret the Bible literally, believing that the world was created in seven days and that Noah's Ark saved humanity from God's wrath. We're all committed to the same Bible and to uh, a pretty literalistic interpretation as opposed to an allegorical or symbolic interpretation. By literally interpreting the Bible, Pentecostals believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth, an event biblically marking the end of the world. There is a yearning and an urgency, and so what motivates our relationship with God and what motivates us to tell as many people as we can is we feel like the Lord is coming back real soon, and we've got to get ready for it. Dean Bernard is far from being alone. The largest church in the world today is the Yoido Full Gospel Church, a Pentecostal church in Seoul, Korea, with over a half million members and six services a day. If you can imagine one church the size of the population of Atlanta, Georgia, and all paying tithes, you can see the power of this church in Seoul, Korea. Dr. Vincent Sinan, Dean of Regent University and author of The Holiness Pentecostal Tradition, explains how the Pentecostal movement has exploded worldwide. Pentecostalism is now the religion of choice of the third world. The Pentecostal church has taken root in the Americas with an estimated four million members in Brazil. Pentecostalism is growing faster in Latin America than anywhere else in the world. In some places in Latin America, the percentage of Pentecostals is edging up from 25 to 30 to 35 to 40 percent. At present growth rates, there could be Pentecostal majorities in some countries within the next few decades. And that's on a continent in which for five centuries now, the Roman Catholic Church has been religiously and culturally dominant. It's conceivable that the Pentecostals would become a majority of all the Christians in the world in the next century. Hallelujah! <laughs> Although now a global movement, the Pentecostal church has its roots here in the United States. Pentecostalism, as it now is growing and spreading, surely has to be understood as originally an American religious movement. With a spirit of equality among believers, modern Pentecostalism proclaims that everyone can have a direct experience with the divine, regardless of class or education. There's no way you can really explain what it is. That's why it's an experience. This is not a denomination. It's an experience. The experience that's real with God 
that anyone can have. Yes, Lord. The presence of the Lord. Next, with the energy of a rock concert, see why Pentecostal services are sending worshipers out of their seats and into the aisles. When you come into a Pentecostal church, you'll find a music that's fast and exuberating. You'll see people shouting. They'll run across the aisles or jump up and down. I don't think you can understand Pentecostalism at all without understanding the music. not only an important element, it's an absolutely essential element in the whole movement. This is a, a musical movement in many ways. Sing a lot. When they pray and when they preach, there's a kind of a musical quality about it. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. We praise your name in this house. Jesus, we love you. We worship and adore you. Hallelujah. Pentecostals view church as a time for people to connect one-on-one -on -one to God and to each other. The Pentecostal church, there was something about the worship that was so exciting. It was people that were not controlled by their emotions. You could tell they was really happy. There was a smile on most of their faces. And uh, it was just a joy. There's something different. From a church of 200 to a stadium of 20,000, Pentecostals claim the charged atmosphere of their services is due to the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Birmingham, Alabama, at the annual General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church, the showman, like the Reverend Jerry Jones, preaches to over 10,000 exuberant attendees from all across America. When the people gather together, we want that energy because we believe that that energy is a response to the presence of the Lord, that He does come to be with us through His Spirit, but that He is there. And that's when people's individual needs can be met in a service with 10,000 people. Of course, when you are anointed, you feel the Spirit of the Lord come upon you and you are preaching His Word, people respond in different ways to that. And my response is of rather, I get excited and it comes across as I speak, I think. At least people tell me it does, you know. There's never been Moving beyond established rituals and recitations, the passionate preachers in the Pentecostal churches employ a far looser structure in their services. We use no liturgy, no ritualistic approach to God, so there is a freedom of worship there. A Pentecostal preacher has to be a kind of an artist and a diplomat, a, a careful director of a, a symphony orchestra in which there isn't any score. <laughs> I want you to come right now. I want you to make this commitment. Despite its largely free-form structure, a Pentecostal service usually ends in a common dramatic conclusion, a call for worshipers to gather at the front of the church and receive the Holy Spirit. Pentecostals view the call to the altar as an opportunity for believers to make a physical connection with their faith, a defining personal moment where one may speak in tongues for the first time. Bringing people to this experience is the real goal. We, we believe that this is, uh, it's often said, essential. The last and 
most unruly part of us is the tongue. And so he chose to symbolize or rather express this experience, prove this experience by speaking in tongues. With energetic music and emotional preaching, questions arise as to whether Pentecostal services simply shepherd the congregation into speaking in tongues. Not being a Pentecostal myself, I can also say that I think that there are some leaders, preachers, who try to induce it, who try to induce it, and uh, maybe try a little too hard from my point of view to, to uh, uh, push it. Uh, but I think that's the exception rather than the rule. Whether Pentecostal leaders coax their flock into talking in tongues or not, they clearly understand the powerful attraction of such passionate prayer. And so as this, this exuberant worship, this joyous experience, the presence of God, speaking in other tongues, singing together, clapping our hands together, shouting together, I think these are the very things that capture people's attention. Typically, people come with a need. They're on the verge of divorce. They have uh, a desperate need in their family. Their, their son is on drugs or they're facing a financial crisis. They will come to a church desperate. They will hear a message. They will believe it. Their life will be changed. Next, the healers and the healed as we look at those who proclaim the Holy Spirit does work miracles. We believe in healing. We believe in complete deliverance. There's people here that used to be drug addicts and alcoholics, and they're not doing that anymore. They've been delivered. And they tried every kind of program before they got here, and it didn't work. But there's something about an experience with Jesus Christ, who we believe is God manifest in flesh. Pastor Scotty Teets tells how Pentecostalism rescued him from a bitter life on the streets of Indianapolis. There was a time I didn't like people. There was a time I was looking for trouble. I was on my way training for a prize fight in Indianapolis where I came from. And I heard the singing and I heard the noise in that building. I said, man, what is this? And curiosity got me. I went inside to investigate and it got a hold of me. I felt something I never felt before. Like many Pentecostals, Scotty Teets received his faith at the altar and spoke in tongues for the first time. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God came on me. It fell on me. I felt it all over me. And my mouth was just taken over by the presence of God. And I began to speak in a language that I never learned in school. And I knew it was a language. And from that time forth, my life absolutely entirely changed. Dedicating his life to the Pentecostal church as a pastor, Teets took his new message to a largely immigrant neighborhood. I have French Guyanese in this church. I have uh, English speaking Guyanese. There's Polish here, there's Jews here, there's uh, Italianos. I have a few Americans with Jamaicans, people from Trinidad, people from Africa, Germany, Polish. There's 23 different nationalities are in this church, and uh, we all get along real good. Defying stereotypes of being a religion confined to the Deep South, the Pentecostal church has built a stronghold in the inner cities of America. What happens in the case of immigrants or people moving to town is they're divorced from their roots, and maybe they were raised in some traditional religion. But now they're not connected to that religion. They're looking for friends. They're looking for family. They're looking for help. They provide a kind of uh, community in a world in which there are a lot of dislocated people. In a movement that takes divine healing literally, Pentecostals say their faith can give poor immigrants actual medical help they could never afford. Many of them in the countries they come from don't have insurance, and they're sick. And so they have to depend on something. When they find out that you can depend on God and he's a healer, they're drawn to this because we preach a lot of divine healing and deliverance. And now, you that are sick and afflicted, get ready to be healed. Stretch out your hand to meet mine. 
And now, Lord, I bring the sick and afflicted to you, those with cancer, those with heart trouble, those in wheelchairs, those on crutches, those who are paralyzed, those that the doctors say there's no cure for. Heal! 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 <laughs> I had cancer of the throat some years ago. They told me I'd never minister ever again. I went to the church one more time and prayed, and I said, God, you've been good to me. If you want my voice, you can have it. I come up out of there, and my voice came back. I knew immediately I started speaking in tongues and dancing all over the front of that church. To this day, I've never lost my voice ever again. God does heal. Pentecostals say everything in the New Testament, healing, signs, wonders, miracles, casting out of demons, speaking with tongues, all those things are still happening today. It is in part the embracing of the supernatural that accounts for the phenomenal growth of the Pentecostal movement around the world. Overseas, they react in the spirit and they react in the heart. When you go to a place like India, for example, or China, or Africa, or Latin America, people are responsive when they feel the power of God. They literally can feel, they can sense God's power. And, and they, when they do, they, always, they, they come out. We are all guilty before Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Indeed, we Pentecostal crusades have met with spectacular success when it comes to drawing crowds like that of a rock festival. At one crusade in November of 2000, German evangelist Reinhard Bonnke preached to an estimated throng of 1.6 million Nigerians. Third world countries have experience with evil spirits that they feel dominate people's lives and, and destroy their lives. Now a lot of nice uh, middle class Christian churches will go into these areas and say, these demons don't exist. You just have to get that out of your head that these demons exist. The Pentecostals don't say that. They say, yeah, they exist, and they're bothering you, and they're besetting you, but uh, here's the answer. Lord, I hunger for you. Lord, I'm longing for you. Next, a Pentecostal church at work in the inner city and how their mission to help prostitutes and drug addicts attracted the attention of a president. The Pentecostal church is about much more than the power of prayer. It's about community and charity. And sometimes it's about politics and scandal. Every day, Lord, is like a resurrection to me. Yes, it is. Because I'm so close to God. Why not? Like to see how people's lives can be changed. It's an incredibly important part of my vision for America. In the presidential campaign of 2000, it was no accident that then-candidate George W. Bush stopped in at a Pentecostal church on the seedy side of downtown Los Angeles. He hailed the L.A. Dream Center as an example of a church actively helping their community and a symbol of a national movement. Matthew Barnett is a 27-year-old pastor working at the Dream Center. America realizes that churches have got to get active again in their local communities. We just can't sit around and play church. At the heart of the Dream Center is the War Room, where downtown Los Angeles is divided into a grid, and each zone seen as an opportunity to mobilize forces for the glory of God. We serve about 30,000 people a week, food in the neighborhood, going every day into the streets. The Dream Center runs a private school for area children, where students learn Christian principles and recite pledges to both the American and the Christian flag. I'm sure that there are Pentecostal organizations in communities that do have responsibility for the common good. Whether they're motivated by a marketing ploy or whether 
Pentecostalism is maturing, I think remains to be seen. But with half a million dollars a month coming in from private donors, the Dream Center can afford to set its own agendas, maintaining an array of social services. The Dream Center runs a teen center, an emergency shelter, and medical facilities operated by volunteer doctors. We've opened up an AIDS hospice here to reach out to people who are dying of AIDS. We have um, homes for people who have drug addictions, who are coming off of heroin, and, and just terrible things that they're dealing with. We never have to worry about starving to death because we've got people like Billy and a couple other people that come around for the, working for the Lord to bring food. Billy has been at the Dream Center for six years. His drug addiction cost him his family, but he says the Pentecostal church salvaged his soul and then some. It's a new adventure in my life. It's been a totally, it's an e-ticket in Disneyland. It's a never-ending adventure for me. It's a, the most wonderful thing that has happened to me in my life. Once a week, the Dream Center drives a bus through downtown L.A., picking up the homeless. They'll take in people that most churches won't. They never have to feel like they're outcasts in our church. They, they, they chase, you know, understandable Christianity, where you can understand it. And, it, it, you know, it's very simple, and you have a lot of fun at the Dream Center. Like many members of the Pentecostal church, Elijah is drawn to the vibrant human experience that defines the service. Well, as somebody said, the average church service in America is about as much fun as a leg cramp. You know, people sit there because it's what they just do. I want you to come in the presence of God here tonight and kneel in front of me. And we're going to ask Jesus Christ to come in and fill that vacancy. Pentecostalism is a movement where experience is the basis. People talk about their experience when they uh, go to a, a church or, or a meeting. People are looking for something real. They're looking for more than just a God that they read in a book and study in history. They want to know that God's power is alive and well today, just like it was back in the days of Pentecost. I'm so close to death while I sleep. Yes, Lord, I'm so glad that you woke me up this morning. You know I am. I want to serve you, Lord, another day before you send for me. We want you saved. We want you with us. We want you to go to heaven. Next, the Pentecostal church transforms itself from a religious backwater to the fastest growing church in the world. Pentecostals see the explosive growth in the popularity of their faith as the most significant event in 20th century Christianity. To go from one person on the first day of the century to 523 million 100 years later is one of the major stories in the history of Christianity. But it all started on New Year's Day 1900 when Charles Parham, the first in a long line of controversial Pentecostal ministers, saw what he believed was a miracle. A young woman named Agnes Osmond began to speak in tongues. And she uh, was filled with the Spirit and spoke with tongues. And they said she spoke Chinese for three days and could not speak English. When Parham's pupil spoke in tongues herself, he left to tell America about the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Houston, Texas, a half-blind black evangelist named Joseph Seymour picked up Parham's message and took it to Los Angeles. In 1906, in an abandoned building on Azusa Street, Seymour began what is acknowledged as the first church of the modern Pentecostal movement. For the three and a half years of the Azusa revival, onlookers traveled from across America to watch the frenetic worship. They wanted to come into the major churches and bring in what they thought was this new downpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the mainline churches didn't want it. The rejection was swift and harsh, with one Presbyterian scholar calling the new worship the last vomit of Satan. Fast losing the support of their own churches, those who believed in speaking in tongues broke off and formed new denominations led by decidedly new kinds of pastors. Some people have remarked that the Pentecostal movement has produced a cast of the most colorful characters in church history. 
I'm so happy to be back in America, back to our church and to the evangelistic work. Preaching to her 25,000 members at the Los Angeles International Church of the Four Square Gospel in the 1920s, it was clear Amy Simple McPherson was a bit unorthodox. At one service, she dressed as a policewoman, rode through the church on a motorcycle, and yelled, Stop! You're all going to hell! These leaders are common people off the streets, in the towns, in the villages, in the countryside, without any background. I say the Pentecostal movement took nobodies and made great leaders out of them. I won't tell you how many of the dead have been raised under my ministry and other ministries. All of us in the ministry could talk about that. Oral Roberts was a poverty-stricken youth who claimed his tuberculosis and stuttering was cured by a faith healer. Having spread his belief in a series of healing crusades in tent cathedrals, in 1955, Roberts took advantage of a new medium to reach a national audience. In a weekly television program, Oral Roberts brought his new message of healing and speaking in tongues straight into the living rooms of America reaching as many as 64 million viewers with primetime religious programming throughout the 1960s, Roberts laid the foundation for what would leave its indelible mark on the 1980s, televangelism. Now you may face some of life's toughest... The Jim and Tammy show drew millions of devoted viewers to Praise the Lord Network, fueled by Jim Baker's unassuming demeanor and wife Tammy Faye's flamboyance. Sit down and write the letter today, or you can put it on Master or Visa. The two managed to build a $172 million religious empire, which included a Christian theme park called Heritage USA. Praise the Lord. You can make it. I don't care what's going wrong. There's more freedom to be yourself. You don't have ecclesiastical authorities telling you you can't be yourself. So, uh... Often you have really colorful people. Sometimes they go off the track. When Jim Baker was sent to prison for five years on charges of mail and wire fraud surrounding his fundraising at PTL, the duo became icons of religious charlatanism. If you and enough people will, will send me $100 immediately, I need some very quick money. Oral Roberts himself became the subject of some controversy in January of 1987 when he told a national audience that God would take him home if he didn't raise $8 million towards scholarships to his university. He raised the money. Pentecostals, you can have all the gifts of the Spirit. You can speak in tongues 24 hours a day. But those things, as important as they are, will not save you. It is the blood. In the high-flying 80s, no figure was more flamboyant than Louisiana televangelist Jimmy Swagger. His showmanship rivaled that of his first cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis. In one of the most powerful images of the 1980s, Assemblies of God minister Jimmy Swaggart broke down to a national audience asking forgiveness for his sexual exploits involving a prostitute. I have sinned against you, my Lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain until it is in the seas of God's forgetfulness. Though defrocked by the Assemblies of God, Jimmy Swaggart continued his fiery sermons at Swaggart Ministries in Louisiana. Yes, the ministry will continue. It's part of the Pentecostal culture. Yes, we can, we're all human, we can fall, uh, but we're never, never lost for good. And come back. The, 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 the lost sheep can return to the fold. No drink, umbrella, cooler, backpack, a large bag will be live in the sanctuary. Make sure you hold your seat. Make sure you hold your seat. Despite the scandals and setbacks of the 1980s, Pentecostalism has more than survived. It has flourished. It has become a powerful and undeniable force in American politics and religion. 
human leadership would have destroyed the movement. And yet, I think the very idea and the experience of being filled with the Spirit was so powerful and has such a universal appeal that if people failed, it making a difference. People were still having their spiritual needs met through the movement. It is a movement that is based on the belief in divine utterances, in the power and passion of exuberant prayer, and the mystery millions claim has solved their spiritual needs, speaking in tongues. Next, the greatest threat to the Pentecostal church could be its own extraordinary success. The surging growth in Pentecostal worship takes place at the time traditional American branches of Christianity have lost members. Worldwide, tens of millions of people are voting with their feet by leaving more ritualistic, sacramental-like churches for the Pentecostal churches, which are, are more free, have more emotion and more experience. And much of the growth comes from conversions, as people turn their back on the denominations they were born into. Are the other churches scared? I think the, the candid answer to that is probably yes. The ones that aren't having any success are those that deny the Bible or trying to talk about the social gospel and a liberal theology. They are the ones that are losing out. But sexual choice and tolerance is not an option in the Pentecostal church. I hope it will permit other bishops to proceed with ordaining qualified gay and lesbian people. And I hope it'll encourage all of the gay and lesbian priests in the church to come out, to be open and honest about who they are. We're trying to teach Christians how to be Christians. And the Pentecostals are very conservative on moral questions. They can't even conceive of, say, a homosexual being ordained into the ministry. That, that's unthinkable. So increasingly, Protestant and Catholic worshipers who define themselves as charismatics have incorporated speaking in tongues into their services. Well, it's not so much the Pentecostal church itself as what you would call the charismatic movement, which is spread uh, across denominational lines, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, Baptist. Uh, this is an experience with the Holy Spirit, and it's been very pervasive. Pentecostals take responsibility for the rise of the charismatic movement, and today the term charismatic is often used interchangeably with Pentecostal. Almost half of the world's 5.6 million Pentecostals are now charismatic. From the Pope on down, there has been an acceptance of the Pentecostal or charismatic experience within the church. In 1975, Pope Paul VI officially endorsed the charismatic movement, and former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, was a strong defender of the charismatic movement. Still, there are potentially explosive issues between the old line Catholic and the newly powerful Pentecostal churches. If a church is not growing, the Catholic church doesn't feel threatened, like the mainline Protestant church. But where millions of people are growing, in, especially in Catholic-oriented countries like Latin America, then the hierarchy becomes concerned. So the Pentecostal church has come full circle, taking its place in the mainstream. So what was first uh, rejected, cast out, persecuted, has now come back with great power into the mainline churches. We have Pentecostal students now at Harvard Divinity School, but we didn't 10 years ago. Now they want to come here and study with Methodists and Catholics and Baptists and all the rest, prepare for Pentecostal ministry, but not in some little uh, isolated 
school somewhere. They want to be part of the mainstream. But will broader acceptance of the Pentecostal church dilute its message and dampen its appeal? They're worried about that. They're worried precisely that they're going to lose some of their cutting edge, some of their drive. They're going to be tamed. They're going to be domesticated. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, I, I hope and pray that the, the online Pentecostal churches don't, don't trade in the power of God for respectability, which is the danger. I hope they don't just fade into the woodwork like everybody else. I, I think they have a special message, a special gift for the larger Christian and indeed the larger religious family, and I hope it isn't uh, muted. We now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy I think there's always new movements and new challenges arising all over the world. So if one Pentecostal church loses its fire, here's another one that comes to town all fired up. If the Pentecostals maintain their fire, it will be through the central celebratory message that has powered their astronomical growth. The message that by speaking in tongues, everyday people can have a direct and powerful experience with God. I think the most important thing about it is that uh, it really sort of takes the ball away from the people who have all the formulations and the ideas from the religious elites. It's democratizing because other people uh, can do it. It's not an elitist thing. It's not just for a small group. It's for anybody, any, any race, any cultural background, any financial condition. And once you've received the Holy Ghost, then you have the power. Well, what draws the people is power. It's like electricity. The Pentecostal church as we know it is only about a hundred years old. In that time, the church's numbers have grown to proportions that weren't imaginable just decades ago. As Pentecostalism moves into its next century, with half a billion followers, believers are fast shedding their stigma of being on the fringes of social and religious thought. That's our report for tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm John Siegenbaum. For information on upcoming programs, go to prime.msnbc.com.